Hi there, it's Scott Nicholson, Associate Professor at Syracuse University School of Information Studies. Welcome to the Gaming and Libraries course. This is session number eight. And today I'm going to be talking about the results of surveys from libraries. Now I'm in a different place today. Today I'm going to be doing a screencast. And so you're going to see me, you're going to see some slides. We're going to talk about these things together. And so you can see some of the data that I've gotten from the surveys I've done over the last few years. And again, the goal of today is to help provide context of how libraries in the US have been using gaming. Now, the first survey I did, I did a couple years ago with public libraries. And what we did is we talked to 400 public libraries on the phone. We randomly selected them from some library census data and took 400 out of the 9,600 that are out there. So what that means is the results that we got gave us a plus or minus 5% window on uh, what the real data should be. Um, we got in touch with almost all the libraries. Um, only a handful of them were either not answer the phone or refused to participate. Um, so we actually had a 96% response rate on this survey, which is really great. Uh, it was indicative of how excited people were to talk about what's going on with games and libraries. Now, we explained to librarians or whomever we talked with on the phone uh, what we meant by gaming, this broad spectrum of everything from chess to board games to card games to video games to word games to abstracts, all of it, um, and asked them, do you support gaming in your libraries? And what we found out is about 75% of libraries support gaming in some way. Now, that mainly came from two things. Uh, one was gaming in the children's section, where they had out a chess board or backgammon board or something like that. And the second was web-based games on library computers. And we found about 80% of libraries said they allowed people to play games on web-based computers. Now, this is interesting. Compare these two numbers. This means that 5% of the people we talked with said, we don't support gaming in the library. However, people are allowed to play games on our computers. So I find that's interesting. To me, that indicates a need for more things like this class to better define, help people realize the wide spectrum of activities that fall into the concept of gaming in libraries. Now we found about 40% of libraries ran gaming programs. And what I'm talking about here is a formal time where people come together to play a game in the library. About 20% of libraries actually circulated games. And this is a, a fairly low number. Many of you might have expected more libraries to circulate games, but from this study, only about 20% did. Now, I'd be curious to repeat this study because the study is two years old to see if this is changing, to see if more libraries are circulating games or fewer libraries are circulating games. From what I'm finding, how having games for in-house use actually better meets libraries' goals than the circulation of games, but we'll talk about that a bit more. In general, we found from this survey stronger support for analog games than digital games. Now, again, this is a couple years old, um, but we found more libraries reported using analog games in both their programming and in their circulation than digital games. We also found that the larger the library, the more likely they were to support gaming activities. Uh, so almost all of the large libraries allow people to play web-based games in the library, while a smaller percentage of the small libraries allowed this. So we saw this pattern again and again. The bigger the library, the more likely they were to support gaming, which makes sense because gaming requires resources, and so a bigger library is more likely going to have those resources. Now, we also have done a gaming census. Now, I've done this census for the last two years, and I've just finished it again for this year. Now, the way the census works is I ask about the prior year. So in 2007 was the first one, and I asked libraries to tell me, okay, in 2006, tell me about the gaming programs that you did. And then I asked in 2008 to have them tell me about 2007 gaming programs. And so I've asked this year, 2009, to tell me about 2008 gaming programs. So we're gonna continue doing the study every year because this is gonna give us some nice longitudinal data to compare over time. We ask the libraries questions about what they did, what were their goals, what was the activities that they did, just try to get an idea of the gaming programs. We put out a call to many different listservs, both public, academic, school, um, as well as through the ALA. What we found is um, that we got more response from public, which makes sense, a much smaller response from the academic and the school libraries. Uh, so you could hypothesize that that represents the amount of gaming that goes on, but you can't be sure. And that's the difference between this study and the last one I told you about. Now, this survey was not scientific, like the first one. There was no random sample taken. It was a convenient survey, meaning we just put it out there through listservs. 
that the ALA tried to reach as many people as possible. What we found is that more responders to this survey were using digital games than analog games. So that was different than the random survey we did. And I find that to be very interesting. What that implies to me is that more people think about digital games when I talk about the concept of gaming. Probably many of you felt that as well. This class would be all about digital games. But as you can see, it's not. It's about the wide spectrum of games that are out there. So I'll be curious to repeat that random sample in a few years to see how it compares to what we're getting back from the census, to see if more libraries are turning towards digital games as compared to analog games. Now, in 2006, we got responses from about 300 libraries. And those libraries, we had 178 different programs described to us. In 2007, we got responses from 400 libraries and 208 programs. The reason why there's that difference is because some libraries just filled out the first page of the survey where it told us about do they circulate, um, things like that, general stats about their library. And then when it got to saying, well, can you actually tell us about a program? They said, no, I'm not going to tell you that. So that's why the difference. The most of the data you're going to see is coming from that second number, the number of programs that we're looking at. Now the first question, one question, this was a more general one, do you circulate games? Um, now this particular survey, we found 45% of the libraries that responded in 2006 and 41% in 2007 said they circulated games. Now we may say, well, Scott, that's double what happened from the random survey. And that's because this survey, the respondents to this survey are people who already are saying they're doing gaming in their libraries because that's why they're responding to the gaming census. Very few people responded to this survey and said, no, I don't do any gaming at all. The first survey was random. We randomly selected libraries. This one, we said, come tell us about your gaming. And of the people that are doing something with gaming, 40% of them were circulating games. So what you could hypothesize from this is that in the future, if more libraries are supporting gaming, then the number of libraries that are supporting circulation of games is going to go up. You may believe it's going to end up being about 40%. So we'll see. Now what we found is that PC games were the most highly circulated type of game. Uh, so it, it actually went down a little bit in 2007. So 2006 is the top bar, 2007 is the bottom bar. Uh, console games went up a lot. So in uh, 2006, the console games were fairly low, only about 15% of libraries circulated console games. In 2007, it went up to 45%. That's a huge jump, but that's again, it could be just who happened to see my response, but I, I think this is accurate. I think this is when we've seen a growth in the support of console games and libraries. Board and card games went up a little bit and handheld games went up a little bit. Now we also asked about some of the aspects of the gaming programs and we found that most of the gaming programs were not designed to be educational in nature. Rather, they were designed to be recreational. Only about 10% across the board were educational. Now, in school and academic libraries, many more were educational. About 40% of the programs in school and academic libraries were designed to be educational in nature. About 60% were recreational then. But you can see in public libraries, very few of the games were designed to be educational in nature. We also asked if there was a tournament involved. So was there some sort of competition that went on? And we found about 40% uh, of the time there was some kind of tournament that was involved with the gaming program. Uh, the, and so all of the library types were about the same with that. So about 60% it was just an open play, about 40% involved some type of tournament. Now just because it has a tournament doesn't mean there's also open play activities, but at least 40% of the time there was some sort of tournament that went on with the gaming program. Now, what sort of games were used? So between the two years, console games, 60% of the time were used in programs, and that held about the same from year to year. Board and card games, support went down by about 10% between 2006 and 2007, and PC games, support went down a little bit. Handheld was very, very small compared to the rest of these. So what we found is for gaming programs, console games were the most frequently reported type of game used. Now we also asked, what did they use? What were the programs used? And so what we saw is Guitar Hero was up from the previous year. So in 2006, only about 20% of libraries used Guitar Hero, and it was double that through to about 40% in 2007. That was the most commonly stated game used in libraries. Now again, this was for 2007 programs. Right now I'm analyzing the data for 2008 programs. So I'll be curious to see if Guitar Hero stays up there or if Rock Band comes up because Rock Band, as you can see, started to make an appearance. It didn't exist in 2006 in libraries, but in 2007, about 8% of libraries used Rock Band. Now, looking at some of the other games, Dance Dance Revolution has actually gone down in popularity. So in 2006, DDR was actually the most popular game 
used in library programs, uh, but that went down by about 10% for 2007. So we'll see if it continues to drop or if it stays about the same. Uh, there is a number of places out there where there's a diehard Dance Dance Revolution fan base, and so it maybe it's going to drop and hit that fan base level and stay there. But I do see when we bring out games for our game lab that Dance Dance Revolution tends to be less popular than Guitar Hero and Rock Band. Fewer people are continuing to play DDR. Wii Sports uh, grew in popularity, and I suspect it will continue to do so because it's an easy-to-learn title. A lot of people are still intrigued by the Wii, haven't had a chance to try it before. Um, it's not that threatening, unlike, you know, jumping around on a dance pad. Mario Kart is a popular game, uh, as is Super Smash Bros. Both of these work really well with tournaments, and Eli Neuberger has done a lot of great stuff with tournaments. We'll talk about that later on in this class. Uh, Madden Football, about 10% of the time, and then Rock Band and Halo were some of the more popular games. Now, we also asked people to tell us how many showed up to your library programs. And what we found is from all of the survey respondents that we had, we had over 6,500 individual gaming programs. So what we're talking about here is while there were only about 218 unique programs, many of them were repeated multiple times, once a week, once a month, etc. And so if you take all of the duplicates, then in 2007, just from my data, there were 6,500 gaming programs in libraries. And if you take the number of people that came to that, over 56,000 people came to play games in libraries. Now, National Gaming Day at your library, which was back in November, actually that day alone drew about 15,000 people who played games in libraries on that day. So this is a phenomenon. We've got a lot of people who are engaging with games in libraries, and I'm sure that this number will go up for 2008. Now, we also asked why. Why is it that you're doing gaming in libraries? The first most important goal was to attract an underserved group of users to the library, typically teenagers. Because libraries, public libraries, they get people as children, they lose them as teenagers, they lose them as adults unless they have kids and they come back, and they come back as seniors. So there's two big groups in there, teenagers and adults without kids, that gaming actually has the ability to bring in. The uh, second most popular one is to increase the library's role as a community hub. More libraries are trying to be that hub where people in a community can meet each other, and gaming is an activity that allows people from different demographic groups and from different stages in life to meet and engage with each other in a way that's not seen as creepy, that's not seen as suspect, and it's not commercially sponsored, and it's not biased. It's a safe activity where you could have children and senior citizens from the same community interacting with each other who didn't come in together, getting to know each other, and it's okay in a game space. There's not that many other activities out there that you can have different age groups of people who didn't know each other previously interacting um, except for gaming to provide a source of entertainment for members of the community. So entertainment is actually, if I allow libraries to pick as many goals as they want, entertainment is the most common goal that a lot of libraries pick. But only 10% of the libraries or so say that that is the most important goal. 9% said to provide an additional service for a group of active library users. What we're seeing more and more is that libraries who are starting to use gaming are now looking for ways to add gaming into other library services. So they want to have, for example, a book club, and then they want to have a gaming program that's on the topic of that book club. Or they want to tie it into summer reading, or they want to somehow tie it into stuff the library is already doing. And that's great. The hope with gaming is that it's just another relevant service. It's just something else that we do. It's not this special thing, but it lives alongside of story time and book talks and knitting guilds and all these other things libraries support. It's one more thing. Now, I also asked libraries to tell me about the outcomes. What happened? These were the top outcomes reported by libraries. The number one outcome is the reputation of library improved with participants. The idea here is that by supporting gaming, you're showing a group of your population that you care about something that's important to them too. That it's okay for them to like games. Just like it's okay to like that horrific rock music because the library is supporting it too. It gives people validation at a time where they might not be finding that validation anywhere else. The second one, and this is one that we want to study a lot more, is that users attended the gaming program and returned to the library another time for non-gaming services. That's exciting. That means the users came for gaming and then came back some other time to do something non-gaming. And this is what I'd love to track. If you're a library out there, I would love it if you can figure out how to track this to see if people are coming back another time to do something that's not gaming. That would be fantastic. 
The next one, users attended the gaming program and used other library services while there. So this is the model of come in, play a game, get a free book kind of thing. Um, asking people to use a library card to making sure they see where books are and ebooks and things like that. Uh, users attend the event with friends and improve their social connections with those friends. So that's where people come in together. And that can be also a good library program. If you're running a team event or something like that, you could encourage friends or families to come in and play a game together as a friend or family unit against other friend and family units. Uh, but the next one is interesting, that users improve their social connections with people that they were previously unknown to. That's exciting, and again, this is one of those things that libraries are trying to do with gaming, is to provide connections with people you didn't come in knowing, and create new connections between members of the community. Now, 10% of the time, users that were uh, not involved in the gaming program indicated annoyance with the activity. So. Just know if you're going to do gaming, there's a reasonable chance you're going to have someone complain, someone who's not happy about it. Now, what's funny about this is pretty much any library service you put out there, 10% of the people are going to complain about. That's the way that it works. You know, If you can't find something to complain about, let us know. We'll provide something for you. So no matter what you've got out there, you know, some people are not going to be happy. And because gaming can be noisy and disruptive and perhaps outside of what people believe the library should be, well, there may be some people that indicate annoyance. So you need to be prepared for that. Now, how much do gaming programs cost? We asked um, how much did it cost to get things started? The average cost for startup was $650, which is not that bad, actually, especially if it's a program you're gonna be repeating again and again, that's not a bad cost. Now of that, what's interesting is 22 of the libraries, so about 10% of the libraries that did programs, said their programs cost nothing. That's great to know. You can actually do a program for no money. Now this is done through borrowing equipment, through asking people to bring in their own equipment, through taking donations, you can actually get donations of older equipment that people don't feel they need anymore, but that can work just fine for a library program. Uh, or you can do gaming programs that don't require you to buy games. We'll talk about creation gaming programs a bit later on. Then a number of libraries got started for between $10 and $50. Again, that's not much at all. It's not a lot of cost. And again, this is where people donated the games or got them donated by a local shop. Uh, two libraries reported quite a bit. 15,000 and 25,000, these are both facility improvements. So for next year's survey, I'm asking people to not talk about the cost of facilities. We'll see if that changes this data. Now we also asked about repeating programs. On average, it costs people $65 to repeat a program. Many times this cost is gonna be for things like prizes and snacks. Those are things that you might buy on an ongoing basis. Um, but when you divide that by the number of users that came to the program, the average cost per user was two bucks. So on average, to run a gaming program, it was costing two bucks per user to repeat these programs. And many libraries repeated the programs. This was the interesting thing, is we found that one library, once a library started a program, on average, they repeated it 14 times over the year. Now, if the goal is to change someone's mindset towards the library, then that repeating a program is the way to do that. Having a one-time program that you don't have again is not going to change mindsets nearly as much as the program that you repeat again and again and again, and you get people coming back and changing their mind about the library having something good. So that's the results of our that's the results of our surveys. Now, if you want to learn more, if you go to gamelab.syr.edu, that's the Library Game Lab of Syracuse's website, and you click on this publications link. That's going to take you to a number of articles that we've published, things like that. All of it's in full text that are available. It's also got some online talks I've given. And this talks a lot more about my survey results. And so if you want to explore it, here's the place to do so. Don't forget, you can go over to ALA Connect and go to a discussion board there and talk with other people who are taking this course at the same time. So that's enough of that, and I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.